Oh, goodness gracious. That looks crazy. That looked a little too crazy for me, but God is good. Cover this side with the blood of Jesus. Um, how do I do this? See, I should have. I should have gotten that together before I came alive. But, mm, mm, mm. Okay, that works. Okay, so today is May, Wednesday, May 17th, 2023. And I wanted to just come on live very quickly. And I feel like I always introduce the lives by saying I'm here to come on quickly. But I mean it. Because I just want to share. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, I want to share something with you all. And that is humility. I just wanted to talk about humility very quickly because I don't know what's happening with people. Uh, now I understand when we have our, we all have our personalities. We all have our characters. A lot of us do not like to be wrong. I get it. I've been there. However, if you're someone who really does not like to be wrong, who really does not like correction, at the end of the day, uh, you're putting yourself in a terrible state, okay? Because scripture tells us that God resists the proud. If you're a proud person, if you're ego-driven, if you think you know everything there is to know and no one can teach you otherwise, or someone who you don't deem as being on your level can tell you something new, you're putting yourself in a very, very bad place, okay? Because scripture tells us that God uses things that people deem foolish to confound those who think they are wise. And so you could be looking at someone or you could be looking at something and you're saying, oh, Ugh, what are you even talking about? You're not even that smart. You didn't graduate from college. You didn't go to an Ivy League. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Meanwhile, the spirit of the Lord is speaking through that person. I'm sorry. And so something very interesting has been <laughs> happening to me uh, because God has had me, for some reason, people are following me on Twitter, whereas I was, I was, uh, I flew under the radar, right? And so now for some reason, people are now following my page and responding to something so last night i was just going back into the book of leviticus and i was reading and learning more about um leprosy right and one thing we have to understand and we'll talk about this during our bible study is that when you look to the book of leviticus and it starts talking about leprosy it's talking about skin malady so skin affliction skin ailments it's not all literal leprosy and it's interesting because when I was a child growing up and I would hear about leprosy in scripture, um, my teacher, who was my second grade teacher at the time, was teaching us a lot about leprosy. So I thought leprosy was the commonplace leprosy that we hear about today, which is people's fingers falling off. Whereas no, the book of Leviticus covers a whole array of different skin disorders, things that are actual diseases and things that are just anomalies. And so I was in, I want to say Leviticus 9, when it could have been Leviticus 9 or 11, one of those verses. And it was talking about oh, the type of leprosy that turns a person's skin white, right? And as I read the descriptive factors of this, and I was like, oh my goodness, this, this sounds like vitiligo. And so I shared my thoughts on Twitter. I said, I, I think this particular verse I'm pretty sure it's talking about vitiligo. And there's this habit a lot of people in the body of Christ have where you're presented with information that you have either not heard before or you're unfamiliar with. And the next thing is instead of people to read, to read the Bible, to study, to take it to the Lord in prayer, what happens is people run to say, no, that's not true. And so that's what happened. Um, a brother proceeded to tell me, no, it's about leprosy. And so I told this brother, well, leprosy covers an array of different skin ailments, right? And so he provides me with a, a document. And this document is talking about leprosy. 
I opened the document. I actually wasn't going to. The Holy Spirit was like, open this document. One thing the Holy Spirit does is he's he's he instructs me in a way that when someone even if someone is refuting what i'm saying even though what i'm saying is, is in <coughs> accordance with scripture i will still yet have to go and see what they're saying so even if an individual is offering an argument where there should be none i will still go and read that verse so if there's any misunderstanding i can provide the clarification by the grace of god sorry i covered myself with the blood of jesus mm. My throat's been a little dry, you guys. Sorry. <clears throat> and so I proceeded to read the article the brother provided. And I kid you not. <clears throat> sorry. The article literally said vitiligo is known as white leprosy. Oh, my gosh. So I had to highlight it for him. I was like, well, okay. This is literally, this literally corroborates what I was saying that this book in Leviticus is pretty sure it's about leprosy. And there you have it. Vitiligo is technically a form of leprosy. It's white leprosy. <clears throat> Instead of this brother to say, I'm sorry, my bad. Or, you're right, sister. Uh, you were onto something. You, you critically analyzed scripture. And you arrived to a conclusion that corroborates scripture. And shows that even back then... <clears throat> They were speaking about things that are still applicable today. This man proceeded to delete all his tweets and then... <laughs> I'm sorry. He deleted his tweets and blocked me. I'm sorry. I was laughing because there are two boys in a shopping cart. That's so childish. Um, this man proceeded to delete his tweets towards me and blocked me. I was just... I was I and I'm. this is what I'm talking about, right? <clears throat> Why are we so prideful where we can't admit, oh, my bad, I got it wrong. It's nothing for us to be able to say, oh, I misspoke. And this goes back to what I'm always saying. Don't be quick to speak. If something is new to you, if something sounds different, <clears throat> pause. You don't always have to jump in people's comments or jump, you know, jump in people's faces and say that's wrong. You don't know what God has revealed to them. You also don't know if this person is a diligent studier of scripture. You don't know people. And I think it just shows our heart placement, our pride, when <clears throat> we don't know how to talk to brothers and sisters. Amen. Second, I'm back again with the with the prophet. <laughs> okay. I hate having to discuss this because it's not even funny. I laugh sometimes. Even though things are serious, I laugh because um, if I don't laugh, I'm either going to cry or I'm going to get irritated. So if you see me laughing sometimes, it's not always a funny thing that I'm laughing at. <clears throat> now, there's a man on this app by the name of, this is his handle, Prophet T.L. Stevens with the V. And I have mentioned this man before. Um... This was a man who was teaching, honestly, <clears throat> heresy. And so I was very concerned. And I was like, who did you learn this from? He proceeds to say, <coughs> Joel Osteen, that when he was at the point of being suicidal, Joel Osteen brought him out of um, darkness. And I was like, wow, thank God for your life. But Joel Osteen is also still a false teacher. And rather <coughs> than this man, Prophet T.L. Stevens, asked me, why do you think or why do you accuse Joel Osteen of being a false teacher? This prophet proceeds to query me of my rank, right? He begins to ask me, what is your rank? And I was confused because I never heard such a question in all my life. And I, I, I was like, what do you mean? What is my rank? And he was like, are you a prophet? Are you an apostle? Are you a pastor? What are you? What are you for you to talk about Joel Osteen? And I was like, what i'm a christian i'm discerning like it, what what is happening right now it, it really honestly family it really threw me off i didn't know that was a thing i'm not used to christians who pull rank i thought all of us were one in christ excuse me <laughs> so here we are apparently there apparently there are ranks to this christian christian walk there are offices but there are no ranks there are offices y'all Offices are not ranks. Okay. So I I was utterly disturbed in my spirit when that man um said that. And I was just like, okay. 
okay, I'm going, I'm going to log off now. So fast forward to today. There's a brother on here. Forgive me, Lord. I do not know the handles of any of the men I follow. I follow a lot of brothers and I don't know some of their names and I do not know some of their handles. I'm not going to hold nobody. But this particular brother, he's into apologetics and whew, uh, I don't, I don't remember his handle, but this particular brother proceeds to share another video from this prophet T.L. Stevens today. And the, the teaching was how to, how to successfully cast out a demon. <clears throat> and I, I say all this to say, brothers and sisters, be wary of who is out here teaching y'all. Seriously. Uh, there are people who are just making up things as they go. It's not even funny. There are people who are making up things as they go. I mean, he was saying, you, you got you to gotta cast it out. And then when you cast out the demon, it stays in the atmosphere and it hovers. You cannot make this up. This is what this man was teaching. He was like, but when you cover yourself with the blood, the demon is still there. You're just covering it with the blood. I was like, what? What does that even mean? I, I, you guys, you can't make this up. You cannot make this up. I, okay, so... Um, I want to make one thing abundantly clear, right? When people start giving you mathematical calculations as to how to cast out demons, you gotta, you gotta pause. You gotta pause. Um, we should look to scripture for understanding on what it looks like for God to use you to cast a demon out of a person, right? Um, Jesus is very clear in his word. When he commissioned the 70 to go out and cast demons out, they cast out demons in his name. Same with Paul, same with Peter, Cephas, all of them, right? But also understand this. Jesus also made it clear that there are some demons you can't just up and command out. You have to pray and fast concerning these types of spirits, right? And so we have to understand that First of all, if you're praying and fasting, you're seeking the Lord. So God is going to be the one to give you understanding in regards to this specific ministry, which all of us honestly should be operating in. People who say, I have a deliverance ministry. Um, respectfully, respectfully, all of us as believers should have deliverance ministries. All of us, we are the ministry. We should be delivering people in the name of Jesus. Really, it's God who delivers people. God just uses us. But... There shouldn't be a thing of, oh, I'm the best deliverance. No, no, no. no. <laughs> All of us as disciples of Christ should be, I'm not going to hold y'all. We should be walking as Jesus instructed. And so I was very concerned when I heard this man say that. Uh, I have had, um, we're not even going to talk about that. Um, it was just very interesting because last Yesterday, God really had me um, meditating on the word. And I was just thinking about deliverance ministries and how I really personally, and I've shared this with you guys before on live. I really do not like how a lot of people, I'm going to name drop because uh, you know, I have no, I ain't for nobody. Uh, and I'm not here to cause dissension in the faith. I'm not here to cause drama between brothers and sisters in Christ or self-professing Christians. But when we start moving in a way that is giving ourselves glory and the glory is going away from the one who deserves all the glory and honor, Jesus Christ, it's a problem. Isaiah Saldivar and the demon slayers. All of that. Where you walk around, I can slay demons. First of all, that in itself is a conundrum. You can't slay something that's already dead. The only person who can destroy ministries i'm not gonna lie it's very tasteless to me god can lead you to post about your deliverance to post about how he used you to deliver someone so that someone else who is struggling will see it and be like oh my goodness this is the answer this is the solution i need <clears throat> and it speaks to the heart placement but you will know people who are posting just to see look at what god did for me wow look at what i did by the power of god what did jesus say when the 70 returned to him they came back to Jesus, hype. You won't believe it, master. But we cast out demons in your name. They obeyed us like it's lit. And Jesus was like, first of all, calm down. Calm down. I'm not going to act like I don't understand how hype it is when you are 
outside of a church setting because when you're in a church setting and you see manifestations you're like it becomes normal if this is something you're used to but if god has you outside of a church service <clears throat> praying with someone or praying for someone and then the Holy Spirit begins to tell you to command the spirit out and you see manifestation and you are the one you are the one God is using it's a different I'm not gonna lie it's a different emotion you feel like whoa whoa God you're using me me I get it but we should we should be prepared for that when we read scripture God tells us it, very plainly right and i know it's a very slippery slope when people feel that and they realize oh there's power to this and god has allowed me to use that power to now say okay let me let me show the world but let me tell you guys one thing we shouldn't be walking in this in this world we shouldn't be doing our ministries for the pleasure of man for applause from men no if god uses you to perform a deliverance on someone, to cast out a spirit out of someone, all glory and honor goes to the Lord. But we shouldn't make it an active habit of so, oh, look at how many people God allowed. No. I told y'all before, I, the, church, the church who conducted my deliverance years ago, they ain't finna put my deliverance out on 4th Street. Oh, they, we gonna have to meet at the courtroom of heaven. Respectfully, <laughs> respectfully. Don't don't disgrace me. Don't embarrass me like that. I maybe it's because I am someone who wholeheartedly believes in hiding people's shame. I am a, I am an advocate for hiding an individual's shame. I don't believe in going on the fourth street and being like y'all won't believe how God shall put in the person out there. No, um, I mean I get it. Some people they'll say yeah you can use my videos to each their own, but I, mm 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 y'all. But back to the prophet T.L. Stevens. So uh, the brother, the brother shared his video and T.L. Stevens was instructing how, how you're supposed to first, well, I don't know the order, bind, loose, cast out, rebuke. He, he was giving a whole formula for how to um, deliver someone from demons. And the teaching, like I said, was just not true. It, he was coming up with something. Maybe he ate Funyuns for dinner and woke up with onion breath and decided he wanted to come on live respectfully. And so I made it very clear. This is the man I was telling you about. This is the man who requested my rank. And this uh, brother Stevens proceeds to, <clears throat> proceeds to ask me. No, proceeds to tell me that in order for you to discern whether someone is a false teacher, you have to have a rank. Brothers and sisters, if anyone ever tells you that, mark and avoid. In order for you to determine if someone is a false teacher, you need discernment, not a rank. You don't have to be an apostle or a prophet or a shepherd or a teacher in order to know and discern if someone is a false teacher. All you need to know is the word of God and have the spirit of the Lord, which gives you discernment because discernment is a gift because what ends up happening is that this creates a hierarchy of sorts. I'm sorry, it's windy. This creates a hierarchy of sorts in the church where the higher ups can do and say and teach whatever they want. And then the lower laymen who don't have offices now, whatever the higher ups say, you dare not judge it. You dare not test it. You dare not discern it because after all, you don't have a rank. Brothers and sisters, be wary of this. These are the things that the Lord detests that's happening in the body of Christ. And so many of us are coming into agreement with these types of teachings and we do not realize we are in error. So many of us are coming into agreement with some of these false teachers who quite frankly have demons in them. And we do not understand the covenant that happens when you come into agreement with these types of false teachings coming from doctrines, literal, literal doctrines of demons. This is why I say test everything. A lot of people will sound charismatic. You're going to see some people and they look young like you. So you're like, wow, you're not old. You're young like me. You're out here teaching. Teach something. No, they're teaching you um, feces. Feces is a fancy word for doo-doo, poop. The runny kind, diarrhea with corn bits in it, undigested. That is what they're feeding you. And you're opening your mouth and you're eating it and you're saying, teach me more, give me more. You're eating poop and they're presenting it as scripture. They're presenting it as doctrine. Brothers and sisters, be very weary. 
of who you come into agreement with because you do not know what spirit some people are moving through or moving in. I've said it time and time again. It's not just because I'm out here as your sister in Christ and we're chopping it up in messages and all this stuff and we come on live. It's not because of that. I really want you to learn what it looks like to discern, to test. Okay? I also want you to learn what it looks like to have a genuine relationship with God where you can go to him as your loving father and begin to ask him, God... Concerning this, um, concerning this person, concerning this teaching, please show me the truth regarding this. Because I've just, I've tested, I've, I've read, but I'm still not understanding. I'm still not getting it. God, please reveal. And then you wait on God to reveal. Some people, they are God. And I'm not talking about scripture, how it says ye are gods. They are in fact God. And so when they pray, they answer themselves. One thing I learned in 2020, and I had to learn this the hard way. One thing I learned in 2020 is that when you come before God with your own preconceived notions, with your own idea of what is correct, with your mind already made up, but you just want to see if God is going to affirm, you want that confirmation from God, trust and believe God will hit you with that. You got it, bruh. When you come before a holy God who knows all things, including the hidden things that you don't know, the future you can never know, you have to come in absolute humility. You have to come to, I'm not, I hope you're not calling me mother. I ain't nobody mother. Please, I am no one's mother. I hope that's a mistype. Please do not refer to me as mother. I am no one's spiritual mother. I don't ever want to see anyone tagging me in videos saying this is my spiritual mother. I am not anyone's spiritual mother. You have one biological mother and your father is in heaven and your biological father is around you. Let us let us end that conversation now. I'm hoping that was a mistype. But when you come before a holy God, you have to come understanding and knowing, admitting the fact that God, I don't know anything. I only know what you allow me to know. And so, God, I ask that you please give me understanding concerning this matter. Because if left up to my own devices, I'm going to get it wrong every single time. God, I need you to help me. I need you to help me discern. I need you to give me the answer regarding this individual, this teaching. And I hope as you're going before God, you're not someone who also loves false teaching. Because if you're someone who yourself loves to indulge in Joel Osteen and T.D. Jakes and Joyce Meyer and Mike Todd and Tim Ross and the likes of Catherine Kirk. Please don't then go before God like, God, please show me because you yourself, you like it. You enjoy it. I'm talking about this is a prayer for people who are genuinely doing the due diligence to come out of false teaching and ask God, show me, please, Lord. We are in a season where God is showing you who these people are and he's allowing you to see it by their own actions, by their own words of omissions. And so not everyone's going to have a, a judgment moment where God strikes them or judges them. There are going to be individuals where you're going to have to listen to what they're teaching, listen to what they're saying, and then compare it to the word of God. And you're going to then have to go before the throne of grace and ask God, what is the truth concerning this person? What is the truth concerning this person's teachings? What is the truth concerning the, the spirit in this person or behind this person? And so let us all be guided. Um, one thing you're going to learn very quickly is that the false teachers, the false prophets, the false apostles far outweigh the true ones. I can't even give you a ratio because I don't know. All I know is that they far outweigh. And so while you see about, while you can probably count 20 apostles, 50 prophets, right? 60 teachers, Go back and test the fruit. How many are truly apostles? How many are truly prophets? How many are truly teachers teaching true and solid doctrine? How many, is, how many of these people is the Holy Spirit actually using 
to convict you. You've been listening to someone for 5, 10, 20 years and you're still doing the same things. You're not drawing closer to God. You've taken maybe five steps forward. You don't know the voice of God. God does not speak to you in any way. God doesn't show you what he's doing in your life. God doesn't forewarn you of the things that are happening around you. Yet you've been under these people. One thing we're going to have to learn is that simply because you feel an emotion and you feel gushy and you feel warm and you're singing praise and worship and you're crying your heart out does not mean God accepts your worship. I think we need to understand this today if we don't understand it, if we never understood it, if you ain't never read it in the Old Testament. Because the God of the Old Testament is also the God of the New Testament. He is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so even though people may tell you, yeah, let's just join hands together and praise the lord because the heavens are open whole time the heavens are the heavens are shut matter of fact they're padlocked closed god is not in your presence what you're feeling are the emotions of the symbols and the pianist and the drums if y'all are a fancy church Yet you're swaying your body back and forth and you're singing Yeshua and all these other wonderful gospel songs. And you think because you're singing, God is accepting of your worship and praise. When he says in his words, what he requires of you, repentance, stop backsliding, obedience. You come into the church every Sunday or every Saturday, depending on when you worship, some of you Thursday, and you cry out to the Lord, and you begin to sing songs of praise and worship. And then after the assembly, what happens is that you package yourself up and you continue in the same sins. You listen to these people day in, day out, and you nod and you say, that's good, that's right. And yet you still continue on in your same sins. But because you raise your hands in worship and you say, God, amen, this is the way we praise. And you think God is there. No. And that's what's happened. People, false teachers have minimized God into a feeling, minimized God into an emotion. There's a different spirit that's moving through churches today. And that spirit closely mimics the Holy Spirit. And those who are undiscerning will hear this or watch this spirit and they'll say, yes, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. People are crying and people are falling down. Yeah, no, no. Go and watch the videos about people who are transferring the Kundalini spirit on YouTube and notice the similarities. You get touched by a yogi on your forehead and you also pass out calmly. Some of the tongues people are speaking in church are of demonic tongues. Yet when we don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us to tell us, do you know witches have tongues too? I didn't even know that was a thing until God told me that witches have tongues too. And I've shared it with you all before. I was in a church years ago. And as the pastor commanded, we all pray in tongues. I began to pray and the Holy Spirit stopped me and told me, do you know witches have tongues too? I was that day years old. My pastor currently makes it very clear. Don't let everyone and their mama touch you or try and anoint you. You do not know some of the spirits operating within these people. You have to ask yourself. You have to. The false prophets and the false seers and the false teachers and the, all these people that were in the Old Testament and the New Testament, where did they all go? Because they never went anywhere. What happened is that the church became so blinded to these people. And so they just crept on right on in. When we look to scripture and we see the slave girl, the young woman who was demonized and she was owned by some individuals and they would use her as a sort of psychic because she could accurately predict the future. When Paul and them came into town, what did she say? She said, you all, these are men of God. She ain't tell a lie. But guess by whose power was she prophesying? By whose 
power was she making those declarations? It was by a demon. Yet in the church today, we would see people who are prophesying accurately, who can tell you details about your life and what you ate and what your last name is. And you immediately say, yes, pop, pop, prophesy. When scripture tells us that demons can also provide us with prophecy, accurate prophecy at that. Yeah. Yeah. Yet yeah, here we are. Simply because someone prophesied. Understand this. There are people who are false prophets as in everything they out here say is false. Mm -hmm. Like Marcus Rogers saying Donald Trump is going to win the presidential election and he didn't. What does scripture say? When a prophet, when a prophet says the Lord saith and it doesn't come to pass, that means that person ain't here Jack Diddley squad and that person should not be feared. Yet y'all are so afraid to call Marcus Rogers what he is, which is a false prophet. But he's also a wizard. But we're not going to get into that. Outside of people who prophesy incorrectly, we're talking about people who are accurately out here prophesying. They're telling you the truth. Just because someone tells you the truth about yourself, about your situation, doesn't mean that person is of God. Brothers and sisters, let us be guided in these last days. You have to search the word of God. You Let me tell you something. Let me say something. Some of you might be younger than me, right? I'm 32. I'm pretty, I'm pretty up there. Okay. I'm not a young, I'm not a young chicken. But let me tell you something about this life. When you keep making the wrong decisions in life, you're gonna get to a point where you're like, I'm fed up with myself. <laughs> I don't know about you all, but there were there have been moments in my life where I have repeated the same mistakes so many times that I was like, I'm oh, mom. You're actually very stupid and you need to be a very serious person. I have to be honest with myself. Like, I'm actually tired of making these same type of callous mistakes. At some point, I need to do better. That was me in relationships. I was like, hmm, a mom, hmm. How many times you you just going to keep going for the wrong guy? Maybe you need to get your life together and just stop entertaining men. How about you do that? And, you know, after men finished dealing with me, I was like, okay. The solution should be I need to be wiser in my relationship choices. And so that's what I decided to do. But let me tell you something. It shouldn't just end with the physical. It shouldn't just end with your relationships. It could be your friendships. Some of you could have had so many instances of fake friends that you realize, you know what? I don't know how many times I'm going to have to deal with these fake friends, but I'm tired. So let me make better decisions with the friends I choose to make and how I choose to respond. Let me make a better, let me, let me change how my structure, right? So why don't we carry that same mentality into our spirituality? After a while, when you realize, dang, I, again, another false teacher? I done listened to maybe five false teachers now and this person too. You're going to notice it. As you grow in your walk with God, you're going to start listening to the people you were listening to. And you're like, mm. <laughs> some about your doctrine smells like salmon that's been out of the fridge for two days. It's smelling funky. As you grow and you build, I see brothers and sisters say it all the time. Yeah, when I started off, Joel Osteen, TDJs helped me. But as I got closer to God, I started saying, uh-uh, something ain't right. So you have to begin to ask yourself, okay, I done been through one, two, three, four, five false teachers, seven different prophets. I'm out here sowing seeds to this random man or woman on TikTok because they told me to drop my name and they will prophesy for me. At some point, you have to realize I have been deceived and I don't want to be deceived anymore, right? And once you come to that arrival and only then, I'm not going to hold you, you have to so desperately not want to be played spiritually. You have to so desperately not want to be deceived spiritually that you go before God and you say, God, if nothing else, <laughs> let me not be deceived. I remember when I go, went to God, I was like, God, I'd rather die I'm not even joking. I was like, God, I would rather die than to be deceived at this point. I, God, if it if it's gonna be someone that's coming my way and they're a false teacher, let me just die then and there. So I don't have to. I don't even have to come into agreement with it. It became that deep for me. And when you realize just how detrimental being deceived spiritually can be, because your soul is eternal, our minds can't even grasp 
what and it means for something to last an eternity. We can't imagine that something can continue on and just never end. And so for me, my soul is much too precious for me to run that risk of an eternity away from my creator because I wanted to listen to something going to make me feel like, okay, okay, I'm here. Okay, no. And when you realize that the best way, the easiest way to be deceived is by not knowing scripture, you're going to very quickly realize I need to literally eat the word of God not literally but I need to figuratively eat the word of God I need to be in my Bible diligently hungrily all of us have the same 24 hours in a day I ain't got no more time than you have but I still make my efforts to read scripture and you do too sometimes God will have you in a book and you're right you're like okay I'm moving on God will be like nope read that over let's take it again line by line let's take it over I don't know how many of you were actor in acting or in music or any of those type of sports where your coach or your whoever's in charge of you would be like from the top, from the top. And you would have to just keep doing it until you perfected it. It's the same thing with the word of God. You keep reading it. You keep studying it line by line, precept upon precept until it is deeply embedded in your heart. So much so that when somebody comes online or someone goes behind a pulpit saying something that even like I'm talking about to the point where even where they pause is wrong. You're like, hold on. <laughs> your your pause is, 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 is irregular. It's, it's not matching up. That discernment alarm will go off. The pride in a lot of us in the body of Christ today, somebody who has done the work to read the word of God is telling you this person is not right because of this. And instead of you to say, hmm, let me test, let me read. Instead of us to say, hmm, okay, I don't agree with you or this is new. Let me go and open the Bible. Let me try. Let me test out my my discernment muscles. What happens is that Christians start yelling and cussing and insulting people. May the Lord have mercy upon us. God led me to the Catholic Church through which I learned the truth. Um, respectfully, Deborah, that was not God. Um, God led me out of the Catholic Church. God led me out of the Catholic Church after 20 something years. I was baptized, I had my communion, and I was confirmed in the faith at the age of 13 years old. And I wanna say it was at 22, God began to let me know something was wrong concerning the Catholic Church. And so, I don't know how involved you are in Catholicism, I don't. I can only say this as someone who was deeply involved in Catholicism stations of the cross and everything our lady of fatima and everything um i would urge you to study the catechism compared to scripture you don't even have to go as far as the catechism honestly when you look to the origins of catholicism and the fact that it was blended with pagan beliefs hence why the queen of heaven spoken of in scripture mary is referred to as the queen of heaven the roles didn't ever change. They just placed other people on top of them. That's why when you speak to people who practice Santoria, Lukumi, Vodun, those types of practices, it's very easy to see many of them are also Catholics because in the same way, um, the early Catholic Church began to blend pagan belief systems. It's the same way the Catholic Church did. So a lot of the spirits you would see that are in charge of fertility and love and marriage, you see the same thing in the Catholic Church where there are saints in charge of those things. And what's crazy is that the Catholic Church goes as far as actually mummifying some of those saints. So you can see some basilicas typically in Europe where they actually have the dead bodies of saints that have been mummified. Not to talk of the fact that Jesus said in scripture, the word of God that came to Moses said in his commandments, um, do not make any graven images of anything on earth, in the heavens, in the waters. Do not bow down to worship it. Do not bow down before it. Yet what does the Catholic Church do? The Catholic Church proceeds to make statues. 
And quite frankly, the statues don't even look like the people they're supposed to be representing. Mary don't look like that. Jesus definitely don't look like that. And on top of that, the Catholic Church actually divided up the commandments <laughs> so they could get rid of that portion of do not make graven images. No, no, no. Mm -mm. We can't have that because it goes against. Are we talking about Peter allegedly being the rock upon which the truth was built? That also is an incorrect interpretation of the text not to talk of the fact that mary veneration was perpetuated by a monk who said he had a dream we're not going to get into the red ladder white ladder dream about this man who said jesus was throwing people out of heaven mary was allowing people into heaven hence the reason why we should pray to mary we're also going to not going to get into the topic of the lady of fatima who appeared to those three children because i noticed a lot of catholics use the, the um apparition of the lady of fatima but understand this satan his agents can also appear as angels of light when we read the book of genesis 6 2 no it's not catholic hating that's the thing we can't call truth hate we have to get out of this mentality deborah of calling truth hate i do not hate the catholic church well <laughs> i hate the doctrine I hate any doctrine that is deceptive and leads people into hell. Quite frankly, we can have this misconception of God. My heart is pure. I'm doing this to worship you. I'm doing this to honor you. God, I love you. But Jesus said it in his words. If you love me, you would keep my commandments. What do the commandments say? Do not bow down to any graven image. Scripture says there's only one mediator between God the Father and man, and that is Jesus Christ. Yet Catholics promote praying to Michael the Archangel, Mary Queen of Heaven, and all manner of saints. You cannot get away from the fact that Catholicism directly contradicts Scripture time and time again. We cannot get away from that reality. And if you want to call this hating, it is unfortunate. But I urge you to get out of, well, I can only pray for you because I was a Catholic <laughs> and that, that's why I thank God. It's one thing if I was never a Catholic, I, I wasn't involved. I was a Catholic, I was an avid Catholic. And so when people would tell me, I would say the same thing. You don't know what you're talking about. You're not a Catholic, you don't know. Let me tell you something. The, the spirit of religion that veils the eyes of people who are in Catholicism <clears throat> is so heavy. Um, it is so heavy and it is so hard. It is so hard, and I thank God because it is only by the Holy Spirit. It is, I can't even accredit myself, no. I can't, I can't say, oh, I read and all of a sudden, no. It was God who opened my eyes one day. And when I read the Bible, I was shocked because I'd read these scriptures time and time again. And when I opened the Bible and I began to read it, it was like I was reading something I'd never seen before. Imagine reading your name on paper and writing it every single day. You know your name. You can spell it backwards. And then one day you look at your name and you realize your name is actually not even your name. That's how it was the day that God opened my eyes and literally dropped the scales from my eyes to actually see what I was reading in scripture, to understand that what I was practicing went against his word. Imagine when you realize that what you thought was right in the sight of the Lord is something he actually detests. Imagine praying to Mary, thinking you are doing right by God, going to stations of the cross, being a diligent Catholic, praying your rosary going for confession, Father, forgive me for I have sinned, or Father, bless me for I have sinned. It has been X amount of months since my last confession, and these are my sins. Trust me, I was out here doing penance. So when I say I was not your everyday run-of-the-mill Catholic who went for Lent and Easter, I mean it. Imagine my surprise when I realized that everything I thought was true based on what I'd been taught from childhood was absolutely contrary to Scripture. And so, Deborah, I pray for you, if you're still on this slide, I pray that God removes that, that veil 
so that you can truly see his word, so that you can truly understand the deception that is the Catholic church and that you can truly come to understand God as a father for who he is. You let down your idols. You let down your pride. I pray you come into this truth. Let me tell you something. The scariest realization is that God will leave people to themselves. If you are so prideful, and this is what I was talking about when I first came on live, when you have a level of pride in you where nobody can tell you otherwise, that is the worst place to be in this world because God will let you have it. I realize in this ministry, the hardest people to get to are people in the Catholic church, people in the LGBT, LGBT community, Muslims, and people in the divine nine Greek fraternity and sorority organizations. These are the hardest, absolute hardest people to minister to because these people swear they know God. You cannot tell them otherwise. They are not open to correction. When you speak, it's like you have B be thorns or whatever they call it, be, be splinters in your tongue. And so when you speak, how do you break through pride? By admitting the fact that you're a human being, meaning you are flawed. When you realize that you are a human being, your, your perception on life is limited. Your understanding is only limited to that which either you know or God has revealed to you. You realize that you don't know as much as you think you know. Also, praying to God to give you a spirit of humility. To helping you understand the truth. A prideful person is a person who thinks, what they know to be true is true. That's it. And unless maybe they respect you and your opinion, then we can, we can deliberate on what you say is true. And dealing with pride is probably one of the most hard things to do. Because when you go before the Lord, when you go before the Lord and you ask him to remove anything in you, that is not of him, including pride. You soon realize that everything that your foundations were built upon, God will legitimately remove it all. Deborah, so you, you said, so you're prideful as well. Um, I admit, I, first of all, I say this all the time. I know nothing except what God has allowed me to know. I only know what God has allowed me to know. You're not, well, you're new to my life, so you don't, I, I don't come on here flashing degrees, flashing what I do for a living. I don't talk about any of that stuff, primarily because I know it's all useless. You, I have met PhD holders who are spiritually blind and heading to hell, and it all means nothing. Degrees mean nothing if I'm going to hell. And so I will be one of the first people to admit, I don't know anything outside of God revealing it to me. And so if my speech, which is littered with um, the understanding of what God revealed in his word concerning my walk in relation to the Catholic church, if you... If you take that as me being prideful, then that is your opinion. However, one thing you're going to realize in this life is that your opinion, simply because you think something doesn't make it true. I know we live in a society where they say your truth, their truth, his truth. No, no, you have a perspective, but your perspective may not necessarily be true. And so while you say that I am prideful, that is your perspective. However, I know I'm not. So... It's Deborah. It's not Deborah. It's Deb Debor Deborah. Okay, sorry, Deborah. Sorry about that. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name. What's wrong with praying to Mary? Mary should not be prayed to. Scripture tells us that the dead know nothing. And so when you're praying to a woman who has since passed away from this earth and is now up in heaven with the Lord, you're trying to communicate with someone who has no knowledge or understanding of what's happening on earth. On top of that, 
Jesus is very clear. Scripture is very clear. There is only one mediator between God the Father and man. A mediator is someone who is a liaison. A liaison is someone who acts as a, a representative, a conduit, a, a middle person, a middleman. And so scripture is telling us there's only one middleman. It's not even you. It's not me. It's not your mom. It's not your grandma. It's not your, your best friend who's a dog. It is Jesus. Why are we praying to other people to be our middlemen? Why are we praying to the dead? Communication with someone who is dead is necromancy. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus is also God. He is the son. And so when we are praying to the only one who can save, the only one who can mediate, that is how and who we are supposed to pray to. When we begin to erect statues of individuals to bow down and pray before them, we're going against scripture. God said in his word, do not make any graven image of anything in heaven. So even though people are like Mary's in heaven, we should don't make anything of anything in heaven or on earth or in the seas. Do not make it and bow down before it. Do not worship it. Yet what do people do with these statues of Mary? Quite frankly, with these statues of Jesus and that don't even look like Jesus. God warned us severely God knew these things would come, yet we see what's written in the Bible and we say, hmm, God, I see what you're saying, but I'm going to raise you a fifth. God tells us how to worship him in his word, and we decide to say, I'd rather worship you this way. And so while you continuously ask me what's wrong with worshiping Mary, I have provided you with an answer. However, you did not want that answer. So why are you here? What, what is this thing? What is this thing where people ask rhetorical questions they do not want the answers to? What is this thing where Christians refuse to open their Bibles and ask God for understanding? And so to the person with the black heart and the tan profile picture, I am a former Catholic, baptized and communion in Nativity Catholic Church, Washington, D.C., Georgia Avenue. Look it up. I went to a Catholic school from pre-K to seventh grade. I went to a Catholic middle school in Nigeria, Infant Jesus Academy, from seventh grade up until 10th grade. Then I went to public school. I left the Catholic church officially in 2015. And so on top of that, I was also an altar server, continuously, consistently received my Holy Communion, went for confession. I was confirmed at 13 while in Infant Jesus Academy, Nigeria. And so when I say these things concerning the Catholic Church, I'm saying it as a former Catholic who God saved and brought out of this. So when you say you can be a Catholic and not know things, um, my people perish for lack of knowledge, says the Lord. My people perish for lack of knowledge. We're not talking about the people of the olden days of the, the, the 15th, 13th century who did not have access to the Bible. When you have access to the Bible and you don't want to open it and you don't want to pray for the spirit of understanding or the spirit of wisdom, you have no one to blame but yourself. We can't stand before the Lord where the Bible was readily accessible to us and then say, God, but I didn't know. God will tell you, you should have known because the Bible was available for you to know. We have to come out of this habit of doing this thing where we try to justify our willful ignorance. And I have to stress willful ignorance. People who are scholars of the word, people who study and read the Bible, they do not have two heads. So what is actually preventing you? There is a little girl who's maybe seven to nine years old who is blind. She knows Braille and she reads the Bible with Braille, yet you with two eyes to see. You refuse to pick up your Bible and open it. 
And then you want to stand before the Lord on judgment day and say, God, but I didn't know. Okay, well, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. I pray you guys um, really, really come to the Lord in, in truth, in spirit and in truth, in spirit and in truth. I have no commentary regarding the Anglican church because I have not researched the Anglican church. I was not a former Anglican, so I have nothing to say in regards to the Anglican church. I think rather than asking me about the Anglican church, compare their doctrine to scripture. We need to learn how to be Bereans, and I'm not saying this to be disrespectful in any way, but we need to learn how to be Bereans. When Paul presented these individuals with the gospel, they said, okay, we hear what you're saying. We're going to search the text for ourselves to make sure what you're saying coincides with what's in your, what's in your text here. And so Paul commended them like, oh yeah, y'all doing the thing. I taught you something. You didn't just take my word for it. You opened the word and began to actually search for the truth for yourself. We have to be Bereans. We can't expect everyone to spoon feed everything to us, primarily because I am not a walking almanac. I, almanac, almanac, whatever. I'm not a walking encyclopedia. I am not a dictionary either. I am not Google. I'm a human being just like you. And so I am not a repository of information where you would ask me a plethora of questions and then I can regurgitate things for you. I do not know in detail the doctrines of places like Anglican Church or a Presbyterian Church or Church of God in Christ. I am speaking to my experience as a Catholic who God, by his grace, pulled out of that deception. And because I was a diligent Catholic, I knew the doctrine and the catechism that I followed and that the church promotes and teaches, which is why I speak about these things with so much fervency. It's not because I had ample time to begin researching this thing. It's because I lived it. And then when I opened the Bible, I saw the contradictions. There are things God will have me researching. The other denominations is not one of them right now. So <laughs> I'm sorry, I cannot help you in regards to the Anglican church. Please take your doctrines. If you are an Anglican, take it to the Lord through his word. Take it to his word. Religion is going to fade away. Your relationship with Jesus is going to be what saves us. Yeah, doctrines of men. Doctrines of men will, will eventually fade away. All we will have is God. All we will have is Jesus. Don't cast pearls to swine. Tasha, Sister Tasha, 2023 was when I learned what that meant. 2023 is when I learned what that meant. I was like, don't cast pearls to swine. God, what that mean? I learned that. I learned what that meant. There, the, the gospel, scripture is, when I tell you scripture is more precious than gold, priceless. And there are people who ask questions, not wanting understanding, not wanting the truth of the word, not even wanting God. And so a lot of us will spend time trying to answer questions or trying to um, tell people this is the truth. And I told you guys, I'm going to stop trying to beg people to come to the truth. But sometimes I can't help it because these are souls. I know, I get it. I know when y'all say don't interact with these people, I get what you're saying. But sometimes we have to remember these are souls. These are souls. And the worst type of place to be is when you think you are on the walkway, you are on the straight and narrow, but you're not even on the road. Like you're not even on the road. At least if you are on the wide path, that's great. You have not even yet found the road that leads to the wide path. And so when I see these people, of course, my heart moves because our, this is someone's soul. This is someone's eternity. What if no one ever tells them what you're following? Your doctrine is false. Not only is the doctrine false, you're actually participating in things that the Lord detests, that the Lord will judge you for. That's a scary place to be. And so I take pity on people, yes. And I know I can't always go back and forth. I get it. It's, uh, it takes from the whole conversation of the life. But God have mercy on us. And may we have a heart to win souls for his glory. May we have a heart to minister the truth to others and not be discouraged or not be frustrated or confused with people. May we actually take time out to try our best to either sow the seed or water the seed. Or try and at least scoop the seed out from between the thorns and bring it into fertile soil. 
Amen. Okay, so, hey, something I'm exploring is women in the world. Oh, my goodness. Hey, something I'm exploring is women in the word and world. Could you guide, kindly give some guidance? I have, I could if I could, but I'm not sure what you're asking. Like when you say the world, do you mean like worldly woman versus wordy woman? I'm so corny. This is why. Goodness. So do you mean like women in the Bible, like versus women of the world in the Bible or outside of the Bible? You don't have to message me. I don't understand. <laughs> it, it's, it's five. It's after working hours. Um, God have mercy on us. <laughs> Amen. I'm still not sure about that. The ones I've been to. Okay, I think you were the sister who said your boyfriend is Anglican. I might be mistaken. Um, can I give you advice? I want to ask if I can give you advice instead of just giving you advice because some people give advice that nobody asks for. So I don't want to give you advice that you never asked me for, Sid. These comments make me sad. People are so lost. I pray Jesus leads the non-believers soon, real soon. Um, Rebel for Christ, it is saddening, but we have to remember that in this life, everyone has a choice. Everyone has a choice to make. Everyone has a decision to make. And some people will never arrive to the decision that Jesus is Lord. That's 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 one of the things God is just going to let lay it plainly. This is the reality. Not everyone will be saved. People will absolutely perish. It is a hard reality to take. But in us knowing that people will perish, it makes the necessity for spreading the gospel even more important. Um, not saying we should be out here waving the Bible in front of people like, hell no. <laughs> but Every opportunity that God presents us with, we should be ministers of the truth. Amen. Um, and what's even more unfortunate is that despite people knowing the name of Jesus, many do not follow him. Many are like the young rich man who Jesus said, sell everything and follow me. Many people do not want to sell everything. They want to believe in Jesus, but they don't want to follow him. And so that in and of itself speaks to, I'm not going to lie, a good chunk of Christians in the church today. Many believe in Jesus. Many call upon the name of Jesus. Some going as far as actually being in the pulpit, casting out demons in his name. Some even prophesying in his name accurately, literally casting out demons in his name. And yet in the end, they will be told, I don't know you. Depart from me. This is a hard pill you will, you will have to swallow. and You have to. Well, you know, and I'm not saying you haven't, but there are some realities that are very, very tough to take, but God is going to have to, God is going to tell you, you have to take it. These are the realities. This world is not this happy go lucky thing where all of us are Christians and all of us are going to go to heaven. There are Christians who are Christian by title only by name only but if you saw some of the things that some people did if you saw some of the behaviors that some people possessed and i'm not talking about demons i'm talking about them you would think they're demonized they're not it's them they're just that nasty of, of the nasty christian by name only brothers and sisters may we not just be um people who open our mouths and say i'm a christian i'm a christian yet your fruit are rotten Work on your personality, work on your behavior. If you struggle with impatience, if you struggle with loving people, I promise you, ask God to help you. I used to struggle. I used to be queen of the clapbacks and it's not even funny, it's embarrassing to honestly have to admit that. I used to be the type of person when you came for me, I would come for you and you would cry. It, it was not okay. And I had to do a whole apology tour for people who offended me and I, I hit them right back. And so I know what it looks like to go before God, like, God, I really do not like people and I'm struggling because I have to love people. How can I love people I don't like? God, how can I love people who insult me, 
when I'm telling them the truth about scripture and to pray. And so if you're someone who struggles with that, when you pray, God, fervent prayer, consistent prayer. I know Lovey said y'all shouldn't be praying all the time. You shouldn't keep praying because that means you lack faith. I'm telling you, it is the consistent, fervent prayer of the righteous. I had to pray until I began to notice all of a sudden when someone would tell me, oh, you're a false prophet, you're a liar, you're a hater. What is that? I, I would go from insulting the person in my mind to God bless you. God bless you. Genuinely feeling sad for people. Genuinely praying for people. Are you someone who deals with struggling to forgive everyone throughout your life has always played with you people have taken you for granted your relationships people have used you your friendships people have used you yes luke 18 the parable of the persistent woman and the judge will god not avenge his like will god not avenge his elect who cry out to him day and night though he suffer with them and so God will, in fact, avenge his elect who continuously pray day and night. Day and night means the passage of time. Yet, Bobby will tell you, no, don't pray too much. It means you don't have faith. Meanwhile, scripture is telling you, as you pray day and night, fervently, continuously, consistently, God will avenge you. Okay. Anyways, are you someone who deals with unforgiveness? I know a lot of people, they struggle with this. I see so many brothers and sisters who say that, they, they deal with it. They struggle with it. People have hurt them from their fathers, their mothers, their parents, their exes, their friends, their teachers. People have played with them. And so they struggle to forgive. You get on your knees. You lay down on your stomach and you cry out to God. Give him your all. Father, you said in your word, when, when they asked you, how many times should we forgive someone who offends us? You said 77 times seven. God, right now I'm struggling to even forgive someone seven times. I'm struggling, Lord. I cannot. It, it's hurtful for me to forgive. God, I don't know where to start. God, you said in your word you, that you will forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. But God, I'm struggling right now to forgive those who have trespassed against me. And since you said you will not forgive me if I don't forgive others, how can I come to this understanding of forgiveness, God? And then you realize you're going to have to give it all to the Lord. God, please take this from me. Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Let me tell you, when you have unforgiveness in your heart, it so burdens you. It holds you captive. You can't enjoy life fully because you just keep replaying the things that people have done. Oh, I can't be this nice to people because they're going to do this to me. Oh, I can't treat a woman or a man like this because they're going to play me. Oh, I can't do this because people are going to say this about me. And it keeps replaying and it hinders you. You honestly are the one who suffers when you cannot forgive. And so what you need to do if you are someone who is struggling with unforgiveness, struggling to forgive, lay it before the feet of God and say, God, I can't do it. I don't even know where to start. I need you to help me learn what it means to forgive. If Jesus who didn't do anything wrong, never sinned a day in his life. Always put people first. If that same Jesus was ridiculed, tortured, insulted, assaulted, and then finally murdered in a brutal way, and nailed on the cross. And then Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. If even Jesus can forgive people for doing what they did to him, who was blameless in all his ways. Surely we can forgive. 
When you conceptualize what Jesus went through versus what you went through, yeah, the pain is real. Yeah, the way they hurt you was real. Yeah, the, the, the emotions were valid. And I'm not invalid, invalidating anything anyone has ever been through. There are people who have been hurt, scorned, cheated on, raped, assaulted, manipulated in the worst possible ways. I'm not invalidating what you've been through, but when you compare it to what the Lord went through, you realize, God, okay, if you can forgive, surely I can. And this isn't an overnight, oh, baby, it ain't an overnight, it ain't an overnight transformation. I'm going to let you know right now. We don't sell dreams here. I don't sell dreams to you. It is a process. And God will so heal. And let me tell you something. Sometimes healing does not feel good. People will make it seem like healing. When, you, when God is healing you, it's so amazing. Let me say something. When God heals you, sometimes it hurts and it feels like you are passing through hell. It hurts. If any of you have ever had a broken bone and you're going through physical therapy, that, that pain, that discomfort, that's what it hurts. But in the end of that physical therapy, in the end, when God finishes building you up and working on you, what you then see is someone who is able to let go and let God to forgive 77 times, seven times. What is it you struggle with? What is it that you're dealing with? The first thing you have to do is admit, God, I'm struggling in this area. Second thing you have to see is what does the Bible say concerning this thing, concerning this matter where I struggle? And then you take it before the Lord and ask him to help you. Amen. We went through a whole lot of random topics. We went through a whole lot of random topics today. I started off this live talking about the pride in the body of Christ and false teachers, right? And we ended here. And that's always good because, listen, all we got to do is allow the spirit to move and the Holy Spirit to go because we might have in our minds, okay, we're just going to talk about this and this be done. And God is like, okay, we're actually going to talk about this. In all things, in all teachings, no matter when you see me on live, if, if repentance isn't taught, I don't, listen, let me say something. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you minute. You better teach repentance. You better preach repentance. You better preach repentance. I don't care if you're talking about relationships. I don't care if you're talking about your friends, being a godly spouse, kingdom marriage. I don't care what you're talking about. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ always have its space, always have its platform when you talk. Because what we don't want to happen is that people hear a word and they hear all these things and they don't, they don't learn what it looks like to have genuine sorrow, what it looks like to have genuine repentance, what it means to go before a holy God and tell him, God, I have fallen short of your glory. I have transgressed your law. I have transgressed your commandments. I have disobeyed. And even though my actions were right in my eyes, even though I, would, I might have been selfish in those moments, God, I ask that you have mercy upon me. Cleanse me, make me new, make me whole. Help me to realize what it is within myself that so desires, craves to partake in this thing that you despise. God, please make me anew. Teach me discipline. Train me up, Lord. Some of us weren't trained properly. Scripture tells us that a parent should train his child in the way they should go so that when they grow up, they'll never depart from it. And some of us, unfortunately, just were not taught in the right way we should go. And so now we're, we're out here trying to figure it out ourselves. But remember this, God is our father. And so God can train us. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as our guide, as our counselor to keep us in the way. And so when you realize that God has already equipped you with everything you need, all you need to do is ask for it. I remember when I was in undergrad, um, you know, the, um, I'm saying you know, but not all of you guys are in college, whatever. I don't know how many of you guys have been through college, went through college, probably didn't go to college. That's fine. I'm going to tell you what happened. So at the beginning of the semester, our, our uh, almost said supervisor, <laughs> our, 
professor would give us the curriculum, you guys. So they give us the curriculum. They'd be like, these are the books you need. Peace. And that, <laughs> and that was it, right? You go to class, you figure it out. If you don't get the book, that's on you. Um, maybe you might get graded if you don't have the book, whatever, whatever. So um, sometimes I used to straight up finesse. I used to finesse. Howard was the, I went to Howard University. Howard was the school of the finesse, meaning if you ain't got it, you're going to have to figure it out. And so I do not come from money. My parents, we were lower middle class. And so I was like, well, um, we got to figure, <laughs> we got to figure it out. And what I would then proceed to do was I would find additional resources, anything, everything I could do in relation to the subject matter at hand. If I couldn't lay my hands on the actual book at a discounted price from Chegg or something, I would go on trying to find as much resource, as much information as I could concerning what was on the syllabus. And it's the same thing with the word of God. The, the, the resources are there. Our resources is scripture. So you only have to do what I was doing, going back and forth through Google and the, uh, the, the National Congress Library. You don't have to do all that. Open your Bible. Open your mouth and pray. The resources are available. You only need open your Bible and search for it. You only need pray and ask God to help you with it. I pray you all are blessed. Um, I pray this blessed someone, this exhortation. Someone said that I have a car ministry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Someone insulted me today. Uh, it was supposed to be an insult, but I'm not going to lie. It was very funny. I was like, yeah, <laughs> you got me. He said, I have a car ministry. And I was like, um, yeah, you're absolutely correct. Because... <laughs> I'm sorry. I know everyone hates when I do that laugh, but you guys, why, why are most of my videos legitimately in the car? <laughs> my sister was like, when she sees TikTok videos of people in their car, she's like, uh-uh, I'm not gonna watch <laughs> She's like, I'm not gonna watch that. I'm like, I'm in my car. <laughs> you guys, first of all, he definitely that was a dig and he absolutely got me and I actually had to laugh because I was like I know you're trying to insult me but that I saw I'm not gonna lie that was really real and that was funny because I legit have a car ministry I be in this car most of my videos are in this car <laughs> and there's a story as to why I'm staying in my car when I'm in my house, my neighbor smokes weed and I don't want that to affect my spirit. So I'm going to be in my car <laughs> when I'm in the house. Literally, my my neighbor has um, he has things in him. And so whenever I get to praying, studying the Bible, reading the Bible, whenever I do Bible study in the house, the next thing that happens is he starts smoking marijuana and I don't want my spirit to be um, tainted in any way. So that's typically why you see me in my car. But yes, I definitely do have a car ministry. Um, no, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> he said I had a car ministry. I was like, you know what? I sure do. I sure do. I sure do have a. <laughs> people, please leave me alone. First of all, I'm used to people just making fun of my wig, saying that you know it's not godly for a woman to have a wig. Now we out here talking about my car, my car ministry. Come on now. <laughs> Oh, that car altar hit different. Let me tell you something. It sure does. <laughs> oh my goodness. But it's good to laugh. Um, let me tell you something. On some on some honest stuff, like on some real stuff, you really have to learn so to my prayer class. <laughs> Y'all have jokes. Brother Kimbo said, it's your prayer closet. <laughs> Y'all are funny. But jokes aside, jokes aside. Um as we all begin our ministries or as we all walk in our ministries, because we should all have a ministry, we should not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. And a part of the word is spreading the gospel. Spreading the gospel is a ministry we are all commissioned to do, right? And so I'm not saying you have to be a teacher. No, God appoints teachers, but it's nothing for you to spread the gospel. That is your ministry. And as you walk in your ministry, you are going to come across people who are not receptive. Um, and quite frankly, you're going to come across people who are absolutely nasty. They will insult you. And you have to pray, if you don't already have this, that God gives you a, a strong spirit that can take insult. Okay? Some of the things that people have said to me, I would dare not even repeat. Right? 
I've I've received very nasty things, very nasty slurs. And I'm not talking about from unbelievers. I'm talking about from Christians. And so expect people to insult you. And even though people may insult you, or even though people will insult you, you still have to learn how to roll with the punches quite literally. You have to learn how to take their lemonade, their limes that they throw at your head and make limeade. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have to um really be able to really be able to laugh at the insults and cons I'm sorry y'all I had uh I had some chicken for lunch sorry you have to be able to take the insults and honestly still be able to give love and give love and give love this don't mean you can't hit them with a little bit of sarcasm now cuz you can't don't mean nothing you can't hit them with a little bit of sarcasm now but in that sarcasm still be respectful I look to the prophet Elijah when the prophets of Baal <laughs> challenged him um, and they brought their, their God and commanded Elijah to bring his God. And when they kept praying to Baal to send down fire to consume their offerings and Baal didn't, Elijah began to say, what happened? <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys, I'm so corny. Can I quote something? <laughs> okay. When, okay. When I was in the world, there was one Tyler Perry movie I loved. And it was Diary of a Mad Black Woman. And there's a scene where, okay, let me give you guys a synopsis. So this man, he's super wealthy. He marries this woman. He, she was intelligent. And he told her to work from home, don't work, just be a, a, a housewife. And she wasn't able to conceive because he would always stress her out. And she would, um, she would just like miscarry. So she didn't have any children. And then the man, her husband ends up impregnating another woman they end up with two kids and then he just drives her out of the house and replaces her right so the man ends up getting shot and his new wife leaves him takes everything he owns takes his children and leaves and now he's in a wheelchair he can't care for himself so they call his former wife the stay-at-home wife and they ask her you know can you help take care of him and so when she first came to take care of him she was very bitter she was like, all oh, those years you put me through. And so the scene, <laughs> this man, <laughs> sorry, it's not funny. I'm, it, it's not funny, but I'm always going to laugh at it. So this man is eating. No, he had not eaten at all for days. And the wife, the ex-wife is just there with the salad. Like, are you hungry? You might as well go to the kitchen and get yourself something to eat then. <laughs> when I think about that, I think about Elijah, the prophet of Baal. He was like, oh. You might as well. Maybe, maybe Bill went to the market to get him some Hagen dazs <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. I'm so annoying. So I said, Charles. <laughs> the man's name was Charles. Christina. Christina's gone. Christina's gone. Christina was the name of the new wife. I'm so sorry, you guys. We're doing an insider. And I, I hate when I give insiders and people do not know what I'm talking about. But if you have if you have seen the movie, Medea aside, because you know I don't fool with that drag, that men in clothes in dresses, but that was funny. And so when I think about that scene from the movie, I can't help but to remember Elijah and the Prophets of Baal. Because Elijah was posted up there like, mm, <laughs> Christina! Christina's gone. Elijah was like, Bill, Bill's gone. Maybe he, maybe he went to the market. Maybe he need a, maybe he need to cry a little louder. Maybe he can't hear you. So that's what I was thinking about. And that's why I say, you know, we do this thing where we make God this stringent God and, um, carriers of the word can't have any sense of humor christians can't have any sense of humor we can't laugh no we absolutely do have sense of humor the holy spirit has a sense of humor god has a sense of humor jesus had a sense of humor has a sense of humor but the thing is our jokes are going to be respectful our jokes should not run contrary to the behavior of a christian right and our jokes should not be at the cost of scripture at the cost of our lord and so when i when i hit people with sarcasm <laughs> When I hate people with sarcasm, they're always like, oh, I'm like, well, Christina's gone. <laughs> Christina's gone. The NLT said maybe he's relieving himself. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Yeah, so like I said, just like scripture tells us, there is a time to laugh, there is a time to mourn, there is a time to marry and be given in marriage, there is a time for us to be very, very solemn, for us to mourn, for us to celebrate, for us to have joy, right? We we already got a lot going on in our lives and we have a lot that we're going to enter into in the years to come. And if we don't know how to find joy in the Lord, if we don't know how to find the joy in the word, we're going to find ourselves a, a very miserable people. I don't know how we can win souls to God if we're constantly in a state of misery. There is a day, there's a time, there's an hour where we must be serious, where we must be gun ho laser focused. We should always be laser focused, honestly. But then there are times, there are seasons, there are moments where we can still yet laugh. We can still yet find humor. We can still yet find relatability. Amen. And so I, I so I said was his mouth bubbly in the water. And so maybe when you all read again about Elijah and the prophets of Baal, you're probably going to read it and you're going to be like, Christina, but <laughs> Christina's gone. Baal's gone. Baal is gone. You might as well go and get yourself something to eat then. <laughs> Amen. I pray you all are blessed. I really pray that this bless you all, this live, this exhortation. Bless you all. I pray that those of you who are struggling with your, with your vices, that you learn to go before the Lord and give everything to him and ask him to truly heal you. To those of you who realize that there is pride in you, because you, listen, a lot of us have pride, right? And we don't realize it's pride until we are challenged, until someone confronts us on something and then we realize we have to, you have to be self-aware, honestly. There's a level of self-awareness that is required. Because a lot of us may not realize, oh, okay, it's a level of pride. And every day I have to check, make it sure. Because I do have moments where someone tells me, oh, you're wrong. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I mean, I know I might not be wrong, right? But that should not be my reaction. My reaction should be, I hear what you're saying. Let me understand why you think I am wrong. Come, let's reason together, right? Right? Instead of immediately dismissing people. Because I tell you guys this and I tell you all the time that there is the person, there is the behavior, and then there is a spirit. You yourself may be a person who is learned. You have studied scripture and so you know exactly what you're talking about. And <clears throat> that is good, right? But when you have this notion of I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, it creates a behavior of pride and that pride can grow into arrogance. As you continue to operate in that behavior of arrogance and pride, you are opening the door for the spirit of pride to then come in. And now you've reached a point where nobody can tell you anything because you know it all. And what breaks my heart is that I know many brothers and sisters in Christ who I have honestly admired in the way that they no scripture, but then I've seen where they then say, I rarely get it wrong. You're human. You're human. Please don't say you rarely get it wrong. Those types of words, right? That, that level of arrogance is dangerous. This is why we must die to self every day. A day shouldn't go by where you're not self-analyzing, okay, how can I be better? Where, where did I slip up? God, please show me, teach me, help me. When we start getting to the point where we're in a level of comfort comfortability where we're like, okay, my duke ain't smelling. I, she, she there. She there. No. We should realize that because we are humans, we are prone to error. We are prone, even if it might not be a be behavioral error, right? It could be something as simple as misunderstanding. That's why sometimes you, if someone says something to you verbally, maybe in your comments on TikTok, rather than immediately saying, hmm, shade, you should ask, wait, can you please confirm this for me? Let me make sure. Because as humans, we can misinterpret someone's actions, someone's intentions. We're not God. We do not know the hearts of men unless God even reveals that heart to us or the person says it with their mouth. And even then, a person can say one thing and their heart can be saying something else. And so 
we are not infallible. We are prone to error. And so every day we have to go before the throne of God, like, God, please show me who I am. Show me my errors. Help me, fix me, change me, create in me, oh Lord, a new heart. Cleanse me, restore my spirit. <clears throat> As you read scripture, you can understand that there are spirits. There, there are things that God can put into us. And when I say spirit, I'm not talking about demons, but scripture tells us that God did not give us a spirit of fear, right? But a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. So we know that there's a spirit of power, there's a spirit of love. There's a spirit of sound mind. But scripture also tells us that there's a spirit of peace, a spirit of wisdom. You can pray for these things. Right? And so when we begin to learn, oh, I can read scripture and I can see the, these are things that I can pray for. When we read scripture and we realize, okay, this is, this is much more than a history book. This is also an instructional manual for my life. Then you can begin to pull from scripture and say, wow, that is a prayer point. God helped that person in that instance. God can help me in the same way. God, you granted, I, I hate with the, well, I'm going to, I'm going to use a prosperity example, even though, you know, I don't be giving prosperity gospel, but all of these things are still the gospel. <clears throat> we just don't decipher them or we don't segregate them. Just as God gave Esther favor in the eyes of the king, right? For the sake of prospering her so that the children of Israel would be saved. It's how you can ask God, God, please give me favor in the sight of those in power, in high authority, that I may make an impact in the body of Christ. You're not asking for favor so you can be a millionaire and you can stun on Instagram and be in a Maserati. You're asking for favor so that you can do God's will in accordance with scripture. Not selfish gain. This is how we have to learn God. Learn how to read the word of God. Learn how to take from the word of God and offer up prayers in accordance to his word. I pray all are blessed. I'm finna log off. I'm finna call it an evening. Um, I pray this bless someone. I will be, by the grace of God, uploading this on YouTube. Please forgive me. Some of the lives are not on YouTube because I'm trying to up, do a re-upload of all my old TikToks. And it's taking a while. It's taking a while. Y'all know. Y'all know. Y'all know I don't know how to do. <laughs> I can't do social media. It's so hard. I already struggled to put the captions on the video. Man, uploading videos is hard. No one ever told me that. Anyways, okay, I pray you guys are blessed. Have a wonderful evening. Please continue to read your scriptures. Continue to study the Bible. Continue to um, build a genuine walk with God. Continue to discern and test every teaching. I'm, I'm very, very disheartened to see that people will go and listen to false prophets and false teachers and then be posted up under my page. I don't know what we're doing here. I don't know what we're doing here for not building discernment. I don't know what we're doing here for not learning what it looks like to know God on a deeper level. Like if you can listen to me for 30 minutes, an hour, and then still go and listen to false teacher and false prophet, I don't know what to say. Here we are. So um, salvation is one-on-one. -on -one. I can't save nobody. Only Jesus can. And you yourself, you have to want to be saved. You yourself, you want to know the truth. You have to want to know the truth. To the sister or the brother who asked how to build discernment, um, by consistently reading the word of God through prayer and fasting, asking God to build your discernment. You can't discern what you don't know. Uh, that, that To simply put it, you can't discern what you don't know. And so let me give you an example. I was going to, I was going to log off, but here, here we are. Let me give you an example. Someone who is an artist, someone who is a painter, s takes time studying colors. So you know the varying shades and variants of something like the color blue. You know the difference between dark blue from cerulean to cauliflower to robin's egg blue and everything in between. And it's the same way with discernment. Just as you need to study the colors, you need to study the word of God. So much so that when someone presents you with something that's even off, you can then tell this is not right, but also... It's not merely studying, right? Because there are people who study the scriptures, yet they absolutely have no understanding. 
You have to actually pray. You have to go before the Lord and ask God to give you discernment, give you understanding of the word, a deeper understanding of the word, to know the truth of the word. So that when someone presents you with the color magenta and says, look, this is sky blue, you will look at them and you will say, in 2 Peter 3.3, 3, it is written X, Y, Z. And so that is not blue, that is magenta because your discernment is being built up. I pray that helps you. Um, I don't know why I'm always speaking in analogies, but here we are. I pray that blesses you. I pray you are blessed. Have a good evening, y'all. Bye.